There's too many trees and nowhere for those trees to go. When you think of an acre, mm -hmm. what do you think of? How big's an acre? I would have been hired. Yeah, oh, okay. you're, yeah you would have been hired. <laughs> hey, you made it, dude. We have got to figure out a way to engage with the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts, mm -hmm. whatever that looks like. Welcome back to the Ozark Podcast. Our guest of the day is uh, is none other than Roger Mangum with the Nature Conservancy. And um, and Roger, you've got a uh, you've come highly recommended to us uh -oh. um, as a guest who can <laughs> walk us through and, and educate us all on the benefits of uh, prescribed burning and, and forest management. Um, talking about the Ozarks and and how to manage for good habitat for wildlife and and other you know things. And so, um, so that's why we're out here. You've been kind enough to take us out into the woods and show us some spots that you guys have done work on. There's been um, timber st timber stand improvements and prescribed burning. Um, and so, one, we appreciate you for showing the spot to us. Um, and two, we're we're grateful for you coming on the show. Awesome! Thanks for having me. This is gonna be fun. Heck yeah! Uh, let's start with what is the Nature Conservancy? I know. So you're the director of the Nature Conservancy. Yeah. What is the Nature Conservancy, and then what is your role within the organization? So the Nature Conservancy like I was sharing as we were walking up the hill here, is one of the largest conservation groups in the world. We work all over the globe. We're currently operating in 77 countries. Um, we've been around for a long time. We started in Arkansas in 1982. Um, the chapter um, really was formalized in 1986. Um, and really what's part of our DNA is we're a land trust. So okay. we're a charity. We're a 501c3. Um, and we started in Arkansas by working through partnerships, particularly with the Game and Fish Commission and the refuge systems, to identify areas that needed to be acquired, so they needed to be bought, where TNC could come in as a, as a, as a private organization, acquire lands based on shared planning, and then eventually when the state was ready or the feds were ready to move those into public ownership. So people could hunt and fish and recreate and bird watch and use them. So that's really how, how TNC and Arkansas started. We grew fairly quickly. Um, when I originally arrived at the chapter, I came on as a biologist here in 2006. Okay. We had about 42 full-time staff that worked all over the state of Arkansas and globally. At the time, we were working in Africa and South America, um, mostly doing prescribed fire work there. So working with local communities and um, national and country partners to run prescribed fire workshops based off of some of the fire workshops that were originally done in Arkansas, which still happen today. Mm. They're called the Camp Robinson Workshops, and they are, in fact, there's one coming up in the spring. In fact, we talked a little bit about that. Those were private landowners and burn associations, burn associations can get fire training. Um, and so when I arrived in 2006, we were still doing a significant amount of land transactions, assisting primarily the state at that time. We also do a lot of land assist with an organization called the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission, mm -hmm. um, which is a fantastic organization and really protects rare plant communities. And at that time too, we were changing in Arkansas to look more at the landscape strategically, really focusing on, on big partnerships and prescribed burning, forest management, wetland management, working on private lands with, with producers and, uh, and agricultural producers on prescribed grazing and enrolling lands in federal programs, WIP, EQUIP, wetland reserve program. Um, and that, so for me, I did that for 10 years and was here till 2016. Fantastic time in Arkansas, loved it. Um, then I moved to Alabama for four years and actually came back in 2019, right before COVID got fierce and worked for Pat Fitz and then Austin Booth for the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, which was a blast. Yeah. Um, and then about two years ago, uh, well, 18 months ago, the director at the time was a gentleman named Scott Simon. He was a fantastic friend, an important ecologist and mentor in my life. Um, thought I should come back to TNC, and we were able to figure that out and came back. Um, then he subsequently retired and left. <laughs> and I sort of looked around and said, looks like I'm going to be running this place. Looks like it's me. Right. Yeah, so I've been the director for about the year. And really my role, Kyle, in that job is to work with a group of about 23 practitioners, biologists, uh, species experts, 
we've got fundraisers, we've got operations team, and then also too, just like on the ground biologists and fire crew who are just incredible people. Mm -hmm. So I support them by trying to raise the funding that they need, either through private funding, through state and federal contracts, state and federal grants. And all of those, operationally, we work with a lot of big landscape collaboratives that are able to work on big landscapes. And we're going to touch on that today. So really, a lot of our work is really executed in Arkansas through our partnerships. You know, we are just really the grease and the cogs that make the wheels move. Gotcha. Um, and that's a really good space for us. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fun. That's it's very fun. cool. And, and and through working with TNC, you've gotten to, like you mentioned, travel all over the world. I know yeah. you've done some burning, not just in the States, but actually in South Africa and yep. South America. What is it like going around the world and, and burning? Um, and, you know, are you having to educate people why you're there and, and why you're burning? Or are people in other parts of the world, they're like, oh, this is a no-brainer. We want to burn. We want you to come here and help us. What is that like traveling the world doing that? That's a great question. It's interesting. But the places where I have worked in depth are the country of Zambia. So that's sort of around the equator, south of the equator and on the continent of Africa. Um, we went there for the very, I went there actually with the U.S. Forest Service as a liaison for the U.S. Forest Service in 2011 to work in um, what was called the Kafui National Park. The Kafui National Park is the largest protected landscape in the world. It's completely mm. unfenced. Um, it's stunning. It's got, it's got, um, I mean, the wildlife is just insane. Elephants, lots of lions, cheetahs, leopards. Um, does not have giraffe there. Giraffe do not occur there. Um, and when we arrived on the ground, um, the landscape, if you can just imagine the size of it, the Kafui National Park in rough acreages, we're just going to say, is about 6 million acres. It also has what are called game management units, or basically conservation easements that surround it for another four. So it's a 10 million acre patch. That's incredible. That's, that's big, man. That's, that's big. Is that bigger than the state of Arkansas in total? Or maybe that's... No, no not, a, no, not, not, a, in, not, not in even total. close. No, it's 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 bigger than maybe like Connecticut or something. Okay. I don't know. Somebody fact check that. I'm yeah. probably wrong. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. At home. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I went there in 2011, and and the the landscape is very similar to Arkansas in the way that it actually burns, and we'll touch a lot on that really? today. So. When I look at landscapes like where we're sitting today, I mean, you look at it as, as vegetation, but I also look at it and categor I categorize it as a fuel. So mm -hmm. it's a model of fuel that, based on certain weather parameters, will burn in a certain way. Well, you get in an airplane, you go over there, it looks just like Arkansas. Hmm. It's a good fit for us. So when we arrived, at the time, the government, well, the, the, the majority of the Kafui is burning almost every single year. So you imagine it's 10 million acres, about 85% of it burn every single year is that from wildfires or is that from actually management on the ground all wildfires okay and the wildfires comes from come from a lot of different areas we won't get into that it gets okay. complex okay but there's a lot of fire um the um zambian wildlife authority which has changed names now the government changed doesn't matter um their group of game wardens and game scouts who manage the game and the natural resources knew that there was the ability to manage fire. They just didn't really have, they knew a lot about fire. They're great fire practitioners. I mean, they were, you know, 400,000 years of being raised and born in it. I mean, they know how to burn. Um, and the landscape wants to burn. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's monsoonal, right? It rains and then it doesn't rain and the grass is eight foot tall and it burns like you can't believe. Mm -hmm. It's pretty awesome. Um, but when I arrived, the Forest Service was doing um, GIS modeling to understand how the fires moved across that place and where they came from to try and allow the game scouts to figure out on how from a um, resource protection standpoint from being a game warden to stop fires that were starting in the middle of the Kafui, which is great. But when I got to know them and told them a little bit about the work that, that I brought to the table of you can manage fire, manage and, and you can help reduce the total amount of fires by using prescribed fire, mm. fighting fire with fire. Mm -hmm. And they latched onto it. And they, it's, it was, it was, a, it was, I was there for five weeks. And when I left, it was interesting. They were very, very nice to me. I got to travel all around the country, you know, sleeping in different villages, um, met all different types of folks from the community. And it actually was interesting. They said, we loved what you had. I bet you never come back. Mm. And I said, 
I'll be back. Bet. <laughs> so I grabbed up a bunch of friends from the Nature Conservancy and the Forest Service. McCree, who was supposed to be here today, Mike Melnichuk, um, uh, and a couple of other fa- fire practitioners I knew from the Forest Service who were, who were good and experienced and could work without a net there. We went back to the same place um, in a town called Gashaka, and we ran the first training seminar, wildfire seminar, where the scouts and community leaders and the ecologists and the wildlife biologists came in, and we would go out and they would basically spend the first part of the workshop writing fire management plans. So what do they actually want to achieve with fire? Where is it going to go? How do we calculate rates of spread? How do we apply it? And then they came up with these fire management plans for these small areas. And then we would go out and we would actually burn these plots using very simple tools we bought from the states. Bladder bags, fire rakes, protective clothing, protective eyewear, simple stuff, mm-hmm. boots. Mm-hmm. Um, and they very quickly realized that based on the science of fire, you know, sci- fire is a lot like forestry. It's a science, but it's also an art. And there's ways that you can predict based on variables of what it's going to do. And they had seen fire for their entire lives. And once they understood they could use it as a tool, it's been great. And so they were executing early season burning in long linear areas, very miles and miles and miles of what we call black line, basically making area that's burned, will not reburn, right? If there's no fuel, it can't burn. Yeah. And so we also knew based on projections of um, late season burning when the grass is tall, the wind basically, it's an interesting system. It's a system that stabilizes from the way that convective heating, and once the convective heating sets and the air columns the same temperature, the wind shuts off. So we know every day the wind's coming from the same direction, and it's going to start and stop at the same time. Mm. So based on that, based on relative humidity, I can calculate, based if I light a fire right here, you can do it here today. If we start a fire right here based on these conditions, I can tell you how hot it's going to be, how how tall the flames are going to be, how fast they're going to move, and when, based on dew point, so when the dew collects on your yard, it'll put it out. And it was really amazing. Like when we were there and McCree and Mike were teaching most of those cor- courses, I was really supporting them and doing a little bit of the background. That when they saw those variables and they understood those conditions as you could control that and we'd go out and light stuff and they'd go back out the next day and you'd calculate that it's going to move whatever when make it up. It's going to move 700 yards and it moves like 680 yards. They're like, you're like, whoa, light goes off. <laughs> like, we can do this. And then you just scale it. Mm-hmm. And so that works pretty powerful. Yeah. I did the same work, actually, did, ran a big training workshop in Mexico in 2009 and 2010. And we were burning in very extreme conditions. Um, really good workshops there. Um, the fire practitioners there, both the ranchers and the professional firefighters in Mexico, were unbelievable, mm-hmm. like hotshot style, like, do all types of great stuff. And that was really fun as well. And we were burning on a ranch called the Las Pilas Ranch, which actually comes up and uh, abuts um, uh, Big Bend National Park. Las Pilas is important because it has the highest density of black bears anywhere in the world. Mm. There are bears everywhere. When I say bears are everywhere, everywhere. Really? Not only in the landscape, but broke into my cabin once, was in the swimming pool, got and ate all of our breakfast. Um, they had a greenhouse, broken. I mean, bears everywhere. So wow. that So that shows you the ecological significance. And what's amazing about this, it's, it's, it's in sort of short, short grass prairie where it interfaces with, with, with the Chihuahuan Desert. So we could be down in a valley burning in Ch- Chihuahuan Desert, and I could look up 6,000 feet into, you know, uh, um, into, you know, uh, Ponderosa pine forest that looks like Colorado. So that's the, the basis of the Sierra Madre where the Rocky Mountains come in. All in one place. It was a 3,300 3, hectare ranch. It was huge. Wow. Um, and just amazing. And what, what they were producing organic ca- cattle that sold, a lot of it actually sold to Europe of all places. Um, and they were having issues with brush like we see here. Right. And so they were trying to figure out, could we use prescribed fire to reduce brush, increase grass without mm-hmm. having to use chemicals so that we, they did not want to use chemicals. They wanted to run a full scale organic beef operation. Worked out great. And so what's interesting about that story that I love is, is you have private industry and agricultural producers who want to produce beef. It's, and they understand fire is an important part of that. And also they know the wildlife will benefit from that. So sort of that trifecta where mm-hmm. everything comes together makes for really powerful projects 
in a lot of ways, those two stories are the exact same thing that we do here in Arkansas. Mm -hmm. In general, when we look at the Ozarks and we look across Arkansas and Missouri, um, and I know you work probably more in Arkansas than you do Missouri, but um, in general, the Ozarks, what is the current state of our forests and our landscape as it relates to maybe how it was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago? Um, How is it the same and how is it different? That is a great question. Well, it is radically different. Um, and we'll unpack why it is. But to answer it directly, um, our forests are not in great shape. Hmm. And, you know, the question is, well, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is we have too many trees. There's too many trees and nowhere for those trees to go. Hmm. So to unpack that a little bit, when, when, when I say that, it's funny because, like, when I tell my wife that, you know, she's like, don't you want more trees? Yeah, well, like, that's kind of where everyone's head goes. <laughs> right. It's like, we're going to save the trees, right? right? right. Like, save they make trees, our oxygen. Right. Exactly. But the reality is, if we got in a time machine, we, we went back in time, most of these systems, particularly on south-facing slopes and west-facing slopes, which we're on right now, um, were, vi- were, were almost savannas. You know, very low tree, tree mm-hmm. density, very high grass content, some forbs, not a lot of forbs, mostly grass. And all that was because of a, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of native peoples using prescribed fire in these systems that not only altered their, them from an anthropomorphic standpoint, but, you know, I mean, people, even today, we are part of these systems. You know, people are not removed from nature. We live together. If we can live symbiotically, that's awesome. In most cases, we don't, but we, we should try to. Mm-hmm. But native peoples taught us a lot about, and also, too, you look at the plant, and, I mean, that's a long of a, that's a long of enough evolutionary history that you had ecosystems evolving into those landscapes and in, into hmm. what the vegetative condition, what the geology and the vegetative condition was producing on the landscape. So in that time machine, you would see very, very wide open forests, particularly in the Ozarks on south and west facing slopes, mostly dominated by shortleaf pine, which is right behind you, Kyle and Kyle. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's interesting, one of the things I wanted to point out to you, and I was looking for one as we were walking up the hill here, um, shortleaf is, is the only southern pine that will actually sprout from the root if it's burned over by fire, which really? is very unique. You know, the other species, I'm see if I can get this wrong, if I can get this right, is, you know, you have shortleaf, longleaf, loblolly, slash, and Virginia. So those are the pines that basically go from Arkansas down to the coast all the way to Florida up to North Carolina, okay. right? That is the southern yellow pine distribution, which is all heavily impacted by fire. That's the only reason that they even occur there is because of the long history of fire. Shortleaf, actually, when it's young, if it's completely burned over, will re-sprout should tell you a lot about that tree is adjusted and talk about a fire climax species, which means it needs maximum amount of fire. That's it. I mean, there's mm-hmm. nothing else that can tell you more about that. And so using that as sort of a key indicator species of what these landscapes were, big open grassy systems, very few trees. They were very large. As you came to the top of the mountains, it started coming down the backside. So the north and east facing ridges, they got more mesic, they got wetter. So you had higher tree densities there. You had black oak and white oak there at heavier densities. And then you would run into areas that were fairly wet and had very little fire in them at all. Mm. Um, There are different models we use. A lot of those models, we basically say they have 1,000-year fire intervals, which means they don't burn. So those are some very unique seeps and glade systems that we have, um, which go back to to touching a little bit on your question of like, what is an untouched landscape? It's a lot to unpack there, particularly in Arkansas. Now, if you move out West or you go to other places in the world, you know, I'm not an expert there. I I don't know. I get it, right? It becomes philosophical in nature, but Mm -hmm. specifically for Arkansas, and this does not necessarily represent all of my Nature Conservancy colleagues, but I'm going to say it is, these landscapes are so far out of, in most cases, the condition they should be that we've got to use, you know, we've got to be managing the timber, silvicultural applications that are planned appropriately to harvest timber out of these systems. And you use prescribed fire and timber stand improvement treatments to try and get back towards that desired forest condition. And you'll hear me say desired forest condition over and over and over and over. So if you take a place like, let's take the Ozark National Forest here is roughly 1.2 million acres. You know, there's, this goes back to that shared planning. So you take the Forest Service, um, Game and Fish, the Heritage Commission, all of the NGOs, including the Nature Conservancy, 
public input have come up with plans and looked across these forests to understand what are those desired conditions. So how do we get them there? And then it's like, okay, within the realms of what's feasible, how do we try and move them into that condition? The overlay too for me and probably you two guys and a lot of your listeners are wildlife will follow, mm-hmm. particularly ground nesting birds. We talked a little uh, turkey and quail. We'll follow those as well. As long as uh, also all of our game and non-game species follow as well. The, what makes that difficult has nothing to really do with nature and conservation. Mm. That has to do with global wood markets. You know, the ability to use this wood and manufacture it. Mm. Changes in tax laws that happened in the 90, that 90s that discouraged large family um, lands that were managed as timber companies to move and sell out and become REIT and TMOs. We can talk a little bit about that. TMOs? TMOs. So, so, so TMO stands for a Timber Investment Management Organization. Okay. So when you get into the forestry side, the operational stuff, which is the stuff I actually really like, okay. that's where I geek out. Yeah. Um, the conditions, right? The enabling conditions to manage our forests in the South have changed radically, even within my career. Okay. So when I originally got, I have a forestry degree and a wildlife management degree and a master's degree in in wildlife management and biology. So when I got out with a forestry degree, that's right when when the uh, North America, United States was changing, particularly from tax, some tax structural assets of the way that large timber companies were looking at timber lands. And what you saw is you saw that companies, I believe if you're a C Corp um, um, tax entity versus an S Corp tax entity, you were able to, if you were, if you manage your land as an S Corp, you were able to decouple the land from the timber asset. And so what happened is you had these companies and more power to them because as compared to investing in the stock market, where at the time you're making 12%, if you were, if you were investing in timberland, you were making about 6%. Mm. But if you decoupled those two assets and classified them differently, you would meet that 12%, maybe even 15% at the time. So you saw a disconnect from the people who were managing the timber base. And so what happened is you lost the art. You still had the science. Yeah. I can still grow a lot of trees real fast. Right. But you lost the art because then you had foresters who really weren't managing places. They were mercenaries, basically managing your timber asset for uh, uh, Wall Street investments. Okay. And then managing the land as a different asset base. And in my opinion, that really deconstructed the ability of the timber markets to absorb all this wood flow. Mm -hmm. It also made us less competitively globally on the wood market. And so those are some of the enabling conditions that make timber harvest and silviculture and the ability to remove these fast growing trees out of this landscape has set us really, really behind. So in a lot of cases, like, you know, when I meet with people who don't have a background in conservation, it's pretty simple, right? You harvest a bunch of wood, you manage a bunch of land, you burn a bunch, you use herbicides where you need, and it all works out. Well, that's not the case. Okay. You've got nowhere for this wood to go. So if you ratchet it up to that high level, you know, we have our, 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 you know, federal leadership, um, and we have our, our state leadership trying to think about on the global market, how are we tweaking and altering to be able to make a difference in wood flow that for me makes a difference, a positive outcome for conservation and all that's interconnected. And when you try and disconnect it and look at smaller landscapes or say, well, in the Ozarks, you know, we we're all, you know, we've got, it's, it's a mess because of this and that and that. You really got to lift your eyes up and understand there are many factors at play that aren't necessarily considered that should be considered by people every day. Gotcha. That impact not only landscape, they impact wildlife. Mm -hmm. I mean, they impact wildlife greatly. Yeah. And so when I think about things that need to be fixed, I want to fix that. I want to fix the machines that are making the machines. Mm. And that just takes time. Yeah. You had had said something at the beginning of uh, that uh, kind of that whole discourse discourse of uh, information there and it was the how <clears throat> human beings in the land have never not been tied together yeah especially talking about tribal people and uh you know these nations of, of human beings for thousands of years who would burn and, and manage and all of that and there's there seems to be this idea maybe since the world became more suburban that the wilderness and then home is different yeah. like it is disconnected so you know the the woods or the trees or the wilderness areas those are outside of day-to-day life so let's leave those alone let them do their thing 
And I've been reflecting on that that thought as you were talking. It's like that's never, as far as human history is concerned, that's never been the case. It's yeah. actually a really new phenomenon to yeah. say where I live and then the landscape around me are, are two divorced things um, rather than all tied together. And so, um, I don't know, I just wanted to throw that in there and see if you had any thoughts as to even how that mindset could play into um, the world of conservation, especially in Arkansas. Well, you're bumming me out, Kyle. That really brings <laughs> me down because, yeah, right. You're right. Um, a lot of this is human behavior. A lot of this has to do with the real significant disconnection of people from land, people from rural landscapes, people who were born and raised in the country and rural places. Um, as we get further and further away from that, I'm really, really worried. In another overlay as well, and I'm not trying to bum you out because there's lots of positives we'll touch on. Changes, climate change is significant. Mm -hmm. Climate change affects a lot of this and it's happening very, very fast. So not only are we trying to positively impact a place that is important for conservation, that's changing like as quickly, like as fast as we can plan, it's changing, right? Um, also too, I mean, that interconnection, like when I think about that interconnection, it's not just spiritual, it's not just that it's recreational, it's not a place where I go for peace. Right, these places make all the food we eat, all the water we drink, all the air we breathe, we breathe comes mm -hmm. from here. Nature produces it, mm -hmm. right? We are linked and people, it, it bothers me a little bit when people think of this wilderness of, or they think of like nature as this, this, this thing that's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in that, we are part of that. That's God's creation, we are part of that thing. Mm -hmm. And um, we've got to figure out a way to feed whatever 9, 10 billion people that'll be here of how to do it and also take care of this because it's what sustains us. Yeah. Regardless how far away we're separated mm -hmm. from it. Yeah. And the thing that drives me, that scares me the most, Kyle, is phones. <laughs> Kids staring at phones. <laughs> I have three of them. It scares me to death more than anything, right? I mean, another reason to be disconnected from what reality really is. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's disconnect even from your, your own brain. Exactly. Yeah, yeah that's, it is. that's the old man in me. <laughs> yeah. Like, Those kids. <laughs> the older we get, the, we get the same thing. Oh, yeah. We find ourselves talking about stuff like, golly, when did we get when to did we start sounding 65? Like, yeah. Um, so, so basically, a, as you were kind of going back to mm -hmm. the current status, you said our forest in the Ozarks isn't necessarily in good health. It's, it's, right. it's not at all. Uh, and we've got all these trees, we've got all this timber, and we've, we've got nothing to do with it. Um, because basically the the market the the demand's not there and there's not the I don't, I don't know how you would say that we don't have the the market to buy all this wood is that essentially what you're saying yeah that's 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 part of it okay um, and it's a big it's a big part of it okay it's you know there you know what's the, you know timber has been in a glut in a low price point for a long time and it's going to stay there for a long time mm -hmm. um, and that is one of the reasons why we don't have the ability and the what's called wood flow, right? The ability to have the wood, cut the wood, move the wood, you know, make it into a marketable product and move it into into a you know uh, anywhere in the globe it can be used. That's difficult these days in southern forests, and mm. without the economies to support it, um, it becomes harder and harder. A lot of the world's facing the same thing. So, right, you have very inexpensive inexpensive wood coming out of Southeast Asia and out of South America. That is sort of undercutting, you know, our wood flow. And here in North America, we're lucky our wood flow is can be managed sustainably and has been for a long time. Yeah. Um, and can be managed for good conservation benefit. Um, that may be the same in Southeast Asia and South America, but in most places where I see that wood coming from, it's not. Mm. That's a problem. Yeah. So just something else to think about. Gotcha. So basically, in the time that we are, how do you then go about managing in the forest? And, you know, when it is so difficult and you don't have the demand. Right. What are the things that we can focus on and, and what, you know, what would you call good forest management in a way that, you know, it's effective cost wise, but also, you know, for the time that you put into it, you're getting the most benefit out of it that you can um, within this kind of unhealthy forest that we have. What can we do? Yeah, a couple of things I, I want to want to just check. The words are important there, too. Kyle. I wouldn't say it's unhealthy. OK, I would say it's just not like in prime condition. Mm -hmm. Got it. Um, and it can be. I mean, the foundation is here. We're sitting in the foundation here. Um, so so getting back in the time machine and moving to present. So if we were in that time machine, we would say on average, if you look at some of um, uh, the GLO data out of um, some of the, the um, early looks at Arkansas, on average, 
you're looking at about a 52 trees per acre. So now we're in the time machine and we come to today. The same data has been done. We're at about 148 trees per acre wow. on the same acre. So it's significant. Yeah, almost three it, times as much. It, yeah. And one of the things to think about, too, that I think is important for this conversation we're about to have is, is um, for your listeners, most people have no, don't understand what that means. Like, I'll even throw it to you guys. When you think of an acre, mm -hmm. what do you think of? How big's an acre? Yeah, I typically think of like my yard or, or like, <laughs> you know, someone's yard that is an acre that I have yeah. known has been an acre. Like, that's what right. I try to visualize is like how much space that is. Right. Cal I is going to say okay. three quarters of a football field. Three quarters of a football field. Those are both very good guesses because when I ask people that, the answer is all over the place. And what's fascinating is I'm going to embarrass myself here. So uh, one of the things I always ask anyone I hire, I ask them, how many square feet are in an acre and describe it to me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, you know, I, you know, I mean, all of the staff we have, all the staff at TNC can answer it. Obviously it's why we hired them. But <laughs> yeah. a lot of, you know, even professionals who work outside, they're like, they can't describe it. So when you think about an acre, particularly for your listeners is basically it's a football field without the end zones. So that so, so I nailed you, it. I would have been hired. Yeah, oh, okay. you were, yeah, you would have been hired. <laughs> hey, you made it, dude. And, <laughs> also, and also, you think too, like I mean, I, I I'm an archery hunter. Y'all are too. You think about that's sort of like the longest range you're going to shoot your bow, and then so that's in distance, and mm -hmm. then crosswise would be about 32 yards. About that's about the longest distance I want to shoot out of a saddle or a tree stand. Shoot out of whitetail. So if you imagine that in your mind. So that is that is an acre. Um, the 43 560 is important. To, to help you think about that. Who has a calculator? I've got one right hey, here. Grab your calculator. Here, okay. comes your, here comes your test. All right, we got homework. Okay. The other question I always ask, I'm embarrassing myself here. My, if any of my coworkers listen to this, they're going to laugh. <laughs> how many square feet are in a mile? Or I'm sorry, how, how many feet are in a mile? Linear distance, straight line. Oh. 5,631. 5,260. Close. 5,280 feet. So y'all were both really close. So put, put okay. that in your calculator. Okay. 5,280. Man, I used to, that used to be a thing that you just knew in school, like in right. all of your classes. We should have gone metric, right. man, right. the world did. Yeah, you should have. <laughs> so okay. then, either, then either square that or multiply it by itself. So I'm going to multiply my mind by 5,280 again. Okay. And what do you get? 27,878,400. Okay, we're going to divide that by the number of square feet in an acre. So I'm going to give you this number. It's a number that you and your listeners got to memorize from now to the end of time. Okay. Divide that by 43,560. What number do you get? 640. Does that have any significance to you? Oh, I don't oh, think so. So 640 are the amount of acres that are in one section of la land on the way that they survey land in North America. So if you overlay mm. that, that allows you to basically grid like all your onyx and everything runs off of those numbers. Now, I won't take you, because your listeners will just, their heads will explode, to get into <laughs> the, the geometry and the trigonometry. Wait, of, what is 640 telling me? That's telling you that in one section of land, which is a description of land, that right. you have six, 600 and, and 640 acres in that section of land. Got it. And that is, what do you call that? Um, a section. Oh, okay, Got just a section. a section. Now you can get into the trigonometry. Right, okay. right. And so what is what is important about that is when you think about, like, how land is measured and how you can actually measure, like, okay, you're saying there's there was 52 trees and now there's 148 trees. What does that even mean? Like, what am I, what am I looking at? So the reason I wanted to share that, that quick and fun calculation is those numbers allow you through quick and dirty math to be able to measure anything and everything you're looking at here. Mm. Um, and that's sort of the art and science of forestry. Mm. It's also the art and science of ecology because it allows you in mathematical terms and using statistics and trigonometry to be able to calculate what is out there and figure out what's good, what's not good, how do we make it good, um, and what needs to change to make it good. So those numbers are important, and I think it's important to share that so it gives you a visual. If you can visualize through this conversation, that football field allows you to think about what you're looking at. Yeah. So for you and Kyle, again, another test. When you look around and you think about a football field, how many trees right here, if you're in the middle of a football field, would be within that football field? Ooh, 
That's a good question. Well, first I have to ask, what are we calling a tree? It's just going to be these shortleaf pine trees, the big ones. Okay, you see. the big ones, not the undergrowth and these small oaks right nope. here. Okay. Oh, within a football field, I'm going to say seventy-five. Okay. I'm going sixty. Sixty. Those are good guesses. I would say probably a little less, but close. I'd probably say forty-five or so. Okay. And so the reason that's important is the main way that we measure this is using a, um, uh, a, an, a measurement called basal area. And basal area, basically the way to think about that is if you have the football field, you take all these trees at four and a half feet, basically your chest height, you take a chainsaw, you cut them off, and you measure that area. You can also calculate that into square footage mm. and using a statistic, you can then calculate the basal area of, of – the actual amount of trees or the volume that are on those acres. That is done mathematically. You can also do it by pulling out a tape that's 37.2 feet, running in a circle, counting those trees, measuring how far around they are, and you can do those calculations. But gotcha. there's a way you can cheat. There's a simple thing that I meant to bring today. It's in the truck called a force prism that allows you to stand in one point, and that prism has refraction in it that will actually count that for you. You can tally that, and that tally will do the calculation for you. Oh, that's cool. You enter all that up into a computer, and it will spit all <clears throat> that out. So wow. we think of, like, forest cruising and how we come up to even establish this. There's a lot of data on what is out there, both back in the day and what's here today mm -hmm. and what we want in the future. So that's really important because when you're saying that the Ozark forests are not what they could be, we yeah. didn't say unhealthy, but they're not great. Right. It's not just, oh, we wish it was like that from what we used to read or people used to talk about. It's data-driven. It's data-driven. It's very data-driven. That data -driven. is so key right. because yeah. I feel like we run into so many people who are like, well, the woods, they never looked like that. that you know, that's a myth or it didn't, it didn't happen that way. Or, right. you know, sure, back when there was the Indians and there was buffalo, maybe then. Uh, but, but what like, about no, before that? They totally. talk about that. It's like, no, it's, it's data. Yeah. It's not yeah. just... <clears throat> I don't know, feelings about the woods. That's right. That's so we, huge. So we know what's out there. And if you look at like some of the large landscape restoration that the Forest Service and partners have done, like on the Sillamore up in Bearcat, like if you go see it a lot, like I've taken people there and they're like, whoa, like this is like radically different. Um, that's a great search image because then you're looking at basal areas of somewhere probably around 40 so instead of having 50 trees or 60 trees that we have right here, you'd probably maybe have about 15. Mm -hmm. So that looks radically different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? That means you get a lot more sunlight to the ground. You get a lot more forbs. But the main thing you get is grass. Mm -hmm. And that grass is the fuel. We talked about fuel that drives all of this. You've got to have grass in the understory to get not only the fire, but the type of fire you want in the landscape to mm. actually reduce the brush so you can see here here on your on your camera and get it into an open condition. That's great for the trees. It's great for um, wildlife, particularly for ground nesting birds, turkey and quail. And also it's important it increases, you know, carbon sequestration both by the root mass and by the trees and also allows for the flow of water to reduce sediment that's flowing over the landscape, basically the grass filters and traps that sediment so that that water goes into our rivers and are clean. Mm. So that's sort of like a search image that you can have. Now for private landowners, like, I, you know, I've managed quite a bit of private land in a prior life. You know, I really set those conditions based on the goals of the landowners, right? In Arkansas, the same way. Arkansas is a primarily private land, private land state. 90% of the land here is private. And our private landowners do a really good job of trying to manage these landscapes got to understand what they need, right? I mean, if I went into a private landowner and they wanted to manage for wildlife, I might recommend we cut it really, really heavy and we burn it really, really hard. But if they want to have that blend of economic return based on the timber and timber type, or they really want to be specific, then you turn back. That's why I described there are ways hmm. on a, to, to the T that using the math and the science of forestry that you can produce what those landowners want. Mm -hmm. And the reason I wanted to touch on that, again, it's it's my background is in those structural ways to look at land. I mean, it can also geek out on all the plants and all that stuff. But when you really back out and you look at habitat from a landscape scale, you've got to use those structural numbers because that's the way the data is coming from you, particularly if you're looking at satellite data. If you're looking at the Kafui National Forest in Zambia, I mean, that's looking at from a satellite very, I mean, you're basically looking at, you know, 30, 30 meter grids to understand what's out there and basing your conditions on that. 
Same way in the Ozarks and in the Washita's, you know, they're able to look at a very large landscape to understand what's in desired forest condition, what's not, what percentage is moving into a condition, what percentage is moving out of that condition, and how do mm. we manage all of that within a construct of where you're limited. You're limited by you can't cut enough trees. Mm -hmm. um, things are slowed down because there's some issue with roads. We can't haul it out. Um, there are issues with having to slow down because you have public input or maybe there's a lawsuit that the Forest Service and our National Forest, you know, face every single day. So going back to your, your point, particularly on public land of like, how do we get it back into that condition? There's a lot of variables of enabling conditions that slow that down. But I do know that, you know, particularly on our public lands with the Forest Service, Game of Fish and the Heritage Commission, they're doing a great job. And our lands are really moving into a great space. Mm. Um, like, I want to talk a little bit about Game and Fish because um, I'm a big fan of the agency. Um, some of their WMAs are just stunning and beautiful. And I, 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 I love it. Whenever I, you know, I'll take people up to Bearcat on the Forest Service or up into the Sillamore. I'll take them to a couple TNC places. And then I really take them out to some of the WMAs because Game and Fish Commission just does, does a great job great place with their lands mm -hmm. some people may say they don't but when you look at it from a landscape scale they're just doing a great job yeah it's really fun to to partner with them and, and watch watch them lead mm -hmm. the way it's kind of cool yeah even on that point to where you go out there and you look at it and you say this is stunning this yeah. is awesome some people might go out there and say what's going on here i don't right. like this i right. wish it was more woody or whatever and we talk about you, you used the phrase earlier desired forest um condition condition yep. <laughs> who ultimately decides you know at the end of the day who gets to decide what is the desired forest condition and um and how do, how does that come into play when you've got different people who have different interests in using the landscape in, in different ways man that is a great question ultimately i guess i guess it's the oh i'm gonna get in trouble for saying this <laughs> i guess it's the public in a lot of ways because on the big federal lands that, you know, all of their planning has public input. Mm -hmm. um, and public input includes me, not only as being a private citizen, but also as being a, a 501c3, a charity that's asked to come in and provide input. So the input that, that the Nature Conservancy provides is probably different than what, you know, just a concerned citizen may provide because I'm providing maybe some sort of expertise in forestry that the that the Forest Service, which has much more than I do, but they appreciate that. But maybe somebody else is considered with, you know, water quality or wilderness or um, specific types of trees. All that goes into these big plans. I'm going to back out one step. So within Arkansas specifically, you've got public lands. Um, and within the, the federal and state agencies, that planning is done by, so, so foresters and land managers and scientists put those plans together. They are then vetted by coalitions and groups of, of partners that all come in a own room, agree that this is what we're going. These are the desired forest conditions based on um, historical evidence, what guilds of certain species need, mm. what guilds of certain aquatic species in these rivers need to survive. And then here's the key, what can we actually do on the ground? Then they break it out to say, well, this percentage of the Ozark should be in this condition. This percentage of the Ozark should be in this condition. This percentage of the Ozark should be in this condition. Then that's not geographically based. Yeah. Then you back out, you measure all that stuff, and then we can calculate based on the 1.2 million acres, both, both public and private, what does that look like? Mm. And that gets in again into the math and sort of the structural components of how you can calculate mm. all that to say, okay, our, 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 um, you know, mid serial mid successional conditions. We need more of that for these reasons. Okay. We're going to shift our planning in these areas to try and produce that habitat. Mm -hmm. So that's how those decisions are made. Gotcha. That's very coarse. It gets very nuanced yeah. quick, but that's the way those decisions. So are it made. was, you mentioned, um, historical evidence. You mentioned species. What were the other ones that you mentioned? Um, what else did I say? What else did I say? <laughs> you had um, said species need, like, uh, I assume you're talking about plants, typically, those, yeah. those fire-dependent... And, 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 and animals, and too. And animals. Yeah, and okay. animals, too. Needs of those animals. And um, 
and then monitoring data. That's a one role that the Nature Conservancy plays, particularly in our national forests, is we have some really great ecologists that work with ecologists from the Forest Service and with some great teams from the Arkansas Natural Heritage Commission and Game and Fish to do the monitoring to say, we want it to be this based mm -hmm. on these measurements we talked about. They go out, they take those measurements. They also then take put in plant plots to understand. You overlay that with like inventories on birds. Are the right birds there? Are the right bats there? Are the right fish in that stream there? Mm. If all that's imbalanced, that has been prescribed by this desired forest condition. And when those align and they're close enough statistically, we know that that spot's good. Gotcha. It changes the next day. It's always changing. It's a continuum. All these hmm. changes happening all at once. Yeah. And it feels scary, particularly for small places, right? You can't do that on 200 acres. You can do it on a million acres. Mm -hmm. You can do it on 10 million acres. So it's it's a scale thing. Yeah. And that, that gets important. And I think, too, because, again, um, private landowners, I mean, I love to hunt. And I, oftentimes I find myself consulting private landowners who want to make big impacts on their places, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. But you really can't quite do it until you hit a certain scale. And that de then the, the number of acres depends on what you're trying to achieve and what the geology and the plants will actually do for you on those landscapes. Yeah. What's that threshold, that acreage threshold? It all depends where, you are, where you're at. <clears throat> Makes sense. It all depends where you're at and what you're managing for. If you're and, managing. And what's around you, too, I would yeah. assume. Yeah. Yeah. And so the way I sort of, the lens I look at that through, because, I mean, really my background is in birds, is I'm thinking quail and turkey. Mm-hmm because those are big landscape species um, that you need to look at from a landscape habitat condition. It's very different than going in and managing for trophy whitetails. That really changes it, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, also, too, in the Ozarks, that could be a difficult thing versus if you're in South Texas and you've got, you know, 100,000 acres to manage for trophy whitetails. It's a, it's a different world, right? Yeah, no, it is. When it comes to, um, you know, even specifically, I know you're going to say it depends. So, like, if I'm, a, you know, a private landowner and I have 100 acres and I'm like, I would love to see quail back on my habitat. And that's like, that is the one thing that I want to see. How do you go about then saying whether or not you can make that impact to actually, you know, bring back quail onto your 100 acres right there that, you know, you can do enough to, to make that impact? Depends on where it is. Okay. And you said I'd say depends. Yeah. So I jumped right <laughs> on it. Um, if you are isolated, so let's say that you want to have that and you are in, you are in a landscape. Let's say you're surrounded by 100,000 acres of ag field with no quail. You are not going to get quail back. You're just not going to. But if you're adjacent to the national forest where they have quail and you're managing for quail, if you build it, they will come. Absolutely. Gotcha. And so, you know, particularly for quail, which, which, boy, I don't even want to get into that. Yeah. There's a lot to be done. If you take it from a landscape, landscape scale, you need a lot of thinning and a lot of fire. And that's what partners are pushing for. And, mm -hmm. and as far as I can tell, the public wants. So we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. It's just a slow build. I mean, it took... About 150 years to get these forests really out of desired condition, it's going to take probably 500 to 700 to get them back. Mm. And you can't rush it. If wow. you rush wow. it, you mess it up. Yeah. So it's just going to take time. Yeah. But we can't quit. Yeah. And fires, and I mentioned that when we were coming out here, fire is one of those things that it's a relationship. It's over and over. It's not one fire application. It's not two fire applications. It's, you know, every three to five years of fire application from now to the end of time. That's mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah. In, in that three to five years, I think I've seen, and I, and I took the, uh, I started taking in, um, it's on YouTube. I think Game and Fish puts it on. It's like the prescribed fire class yeah. 101. Mm -hmm. And I started going through that. And one of the videos, they show historical burn regimes in the Ozarks and in Arkansas, how often the state or parts of the state would burn. And historically, they have evidence and, and, you know, you can tell based on species and, and I, you know, I don't really know how they come mm -hmm. up with it. But they say that the state would burn every three to five years is at least the number that I'm remembering. Is that where those kind of time frames come from? Yes. Looking back That's at historical evidence? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And how do you arrive at that? Like, we're looking back 400 years ago and we knew how often, you know, this landscape burned. There's a couple of ways. Probably the main way, which is the simplest way to understand, is to look at the dendrochronology as you cut down these large trees and basically count the rings. You can see the fire scars in them, mm -hmm. so you can count them. Okay. And then also you can look at sort of the vegeta vegetation tells you a story, right? You can walk into an area if you know what you're looking, looking at. It's amazing. Like, I'll spend time with ecologists and they'll walk in an area like, what happened here, right? And they'll tell you what happened over the last 25 years just based on one plant you that's know, wild one, it, it's really incredible and it's yeah. good 
um, and it's something you build over time. But, you know, these these landscapes, when you burn them, tell you something. So when I go into a really thick forest, like I'm looking over your head, Kyle, there's a thicker forest back there. Let's just say I went in there, took one acre, right, a football field. I cut it heavy. I left five trees on it, right? And then I burned it, and it came up in a prairie. It used to be a prairie. Yeah. And that happens all over this state. Mm. I can take you to areas in South Arkansas that are dense pine plantations. You cut them, you burn them, and they come up in prairie plants because it was a it was a black land prairie mm-hmm. 150 years ago. Mm. All this there wasn't a tree on it. Waiting. Yeah. <laughs> so waiting for it's it. it's those type of stories that yeah. the land land will speak to you. Yeah. You know, just really will. Man, that is cool. L- looking forward, knowing where we're at, um, where things have been within the Ozarks. What what is your idea of of success, and and maybe not just you personally, but you know, how do we think about this as, as outdoorsmen? And, you know, you're talking to an audience of outdoorsmen, sure. people who love the Ozarks. Um, what does good look like? What does an, an idea of success that we can thrive for um, maybe look like in the future for the Ozarks? I would say in the short term, well, Kyle, and you touched on this earlier too, is like we have got to figure out a way to engage with the next generation of outdoor enthusiasts, mm-hmm. whatever that looks like. Like you hear people talking about consumptive versus non-consumptive. You talk about people who, you know, love to float and paddle. People love to ride mountain bikes. People who love to bow hunt. We have got to get the generation, I'm going to say, I'm going to say it because I got three teenagers, right, that are below the age of 20 back out into the woods in a meaningful way, whatever that is. So that's one, right? Everyone knows that. It's Mm -hmm. not a big deal. So that's one. Secondarily, we're in a really good spot. Arkansas, the reason I wanted to work here and spend my career here, and I have been blessed to be a bit of a gypsy and travel all over, which has really served me well in the long run. Um, This is one of the most amazing places to work on the planet. Um, We partner together so well, I can't even describe to you two Mm -hmm. guys. And I know you've heard that probably from all of the different guests you've had on your shows. There is a secret sauce to that that makes Arkansas special where we do things together Mm -hmm. and it feels natural and it feels good. And, um, you know, uh, we don't even, I mean, we, we, we bring different angles to the game, different strategies, but we don't even really disagree because we sort of all at the foundational level know where we're trying to go. We may do it a little differently and we just do it. So, so that's fantastic. So I want to share that with your listeners that I think that, Arkansas is in a really good place. And when it comes to forest management and wildlife habitat, I think we're drifting in a very good direction. There's a lot of work to do. I mentioned on those high level things that are important, but two, you think about, you know, what the Game and Fish Commission in Austin is leading on the conservation incentive program on private lands. That's big. Mm -hmm. I'd love to see that grow. Absolutely. Um, And, you know, I would encourage your listeners to understand that and think about it. And if they believe in it, you know, let Game and Fish know that they believe in that. Let their their local constituents and their legislators know that that's a good thing. Yeah. For anyone who doesn't know what you're talking about, go back and listen to our episode with Austin Booth. He was talking about the conservation incentive yeah. program and, and kind of what's going on within the agency. Yeah. And so they're also too, they're growing up their private lands division and there's some great, great leaders in that division who are good friends of mine who just with the right staffing and the right budget can do big things on private lands in the right places. Mm-hmm. And that's really exciting. So I feel really good about that to close on that too. And even if you think about the national forest and we're sitting in the middle of it, so I'm thinking of it is, you know, you really from, for me, I'm going to be talking about nature stuff because that's what I really care about. Um, you know, you've got source and sink areas, right? Source areas are places that are managed well, that are producing sources of plants and animal that then go out into other areas to repopulate or increase fecundity, reproductive, um, ability of those species. Um, so the source areas, I think, are being managed well, and there's a lot over the next 20 years, I think they will be managed better and better and better for the future, so that's good. So the sink areas are where those animals go, and there's just not enough resources or the habitat's wrong that they just sink away, right? Mm-hmm. Basically, that has to do with their reproductive rates and their fecundity rates, which is different than their ability to to procreate. Um that change in private lands can really extend those source areas further and further and further. And yeah, I mean, we're not going to go back to, you know, the, you know, uh, 400 years ago, mm-hmm. but I think we're really, really headed in a good, 
good direction. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to be a very, very small part of that here yeah. in the Ozarks. So mm. overall, my outlook is positive. Good. Um, a couple of game changers in there that, that maybe keep me up at night a little bit is climate change will affect all of this. That'll be interesting to see what, what happens there. Um, and also too, like just global issues going back to around like timber production and global markets and all of that, you know, it's very easy for us in Arkansas who we have a beautiful state and we go out in the woods and we hunt and fish and we have a good time and to not to ignore all that. If you really care about nature, you can't ignore that stuff. You need to understand it and, mm-hmm. you know, and, and understand how we can affect that in a positive way yeah. to benefit the natural resources we have, not only in Arkansas, but across the Southeast. Right?